love you for it's in your son Jesus' name. We do pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to go old school this time. How many of y'all love to praise the Lord? How many of y'all love to praise the Lord? Amen. His name is to be praised. I love to praise him. I love to Put those hands together like old school church. Come on.
sing a quartet. I love to pray. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Old school church. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Oh, yeah. We'll have a corporate prayer then. to praise his name I love to praise his name the Bible says let all that has breath praise the Lord praise sometime is what to do when, when you don't know what to do when you are confused when you don't know where to turn to just press the burden of praise. Paul and Silas were in prison. There was no way out. As they started singing praises to God, what happened? The prison was let loose. The chain fell out, out of their hands and feet. Jehoshaphat was confronted by three armies, three nations. In the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 20. And he said, Lord, I do not know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Yeah. And the Lord told Jehoshaphat, allow the chorus that the singers to go in front of the battle. What a foolish thing to do. You want to fight a battle with sword and arrow, and you allow singers to go in front line. No bulletproof, nothing to prevent them. And God said, that is the way. God's way is always different from the way of the man. And as they began to sing praises to God, the Bible said, God sent ambus from heaven against the enemy. And they were shattered. When you are down in your heart, can you just turn on the burden of praise and see what God is going to do? Jesus wanted to feed thousands of people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And he said, Father, I thank you. And after that, he gave it to the disciple, keep sending it. And it multiplied and fed over 12,000 people. In the midst of scarcity and inflation, in the midst of lack, and you don't know what to do, just praise him. Turn to me to the book of Isaiah chapter 60. And I'm going to read one from verse 1 through 3. And I will turn to Isaiah 61 as well. Isaiah 60. This morning I have King James Version with me. Are you there? Read with me, verse 1, if you are there. Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness that covered the earth, and the gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall shine upon thee. And the Gentiles are come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. If there is a time to light up our candle, it is now. There are thousands and millions of people groping in darkness. This is the time to put on the candlelight. This is the time to shine. 
And do you know the way we sign? Somebody is depressed. You are there with him. There is hope, brother. Don't give up. You are signing the land. Somebody is lonely. You are there with him or with her. Say, you are not lonely. God is with you, my brother, my sister. This is how to sign the land. Someone is confused. You sit down with him or her. Let's read Psalms together. Let's read the scripture together. This is how to sign. A lot of people are in confusion and just need you just to lift up the light for them to see. And darkness is never a barrier for the light to sign. You just put on that your little light and it will be a race of hope for some people who are confused and groping in darkness. But for us to sign, Isaiah says something in the book of 61. Let's just bow our head and pray to God. Lord, help me to sign the light. At that neighborhood where you position me, in that family where I am, Lord, help me to sign that light. Help me to be rays of hope for someone who do not know where to turn to. Help me to be source of courage for someone who is discouraged. This week, help me to be source of joy for someone who does not have joy. This week, Lord, Help me to be means of supplying provision for those in need. Let me be hope to someone this week, Lord. And this is our heart cry, Lord. In the means of sorrow and suffering in the world. In the means of challenges and sickness. It is not time to spread the gospel of condemnation. It is time to light up the candle of hope and give courage for someone who is discouraged. It is time to tell somebody you can make it, don't give up. It is time to tell someone just forgive and let go. It is time to put on the light of courage and hope for the hopeless. And this is our heart cry this week, Lord. From Newburgh to nations of the world, may our light shine for others to see. In Jesus' name we pray. We turn to Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel. Unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the openings of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable years of the Lord, and the days of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourns, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give to, unto them the beauty for asses. Amen. Out of that asses in your life, beauty can come up. Out of that hopelessness, rivers of living water can flow. The oil of joy for those mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Hallelujah. Can we just pray, Lord, pour out the power of your spirit upon me, that I might make you known in this generation. Pour out your power upon me, Lord, I pray. Just today's service, I want to get in touch with your Holy Spirit again, afresh in my life. For us to serve the captive free, we need an intimate relationship where the Holy Spirit, where his power flow through us and flow into the hopeless world. For out your power upon us, afresh, Lord. That we might go and set free those that are bound by the devil, those that are bound by condemnation, those that are confused, 
those that do not know where to turn to, those that are without the gospel, help us to go in the power of your Holy Spirit just to tell someone that Jesus loves you. And thank you, Father, for the answer prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the church sounds louder. Amen. Amen. In this season of Thanksgiving, there's so many things we can be grateful for. We have family. We have a, a lot of us have a reasonable health, personal health and strength. And for that, we ought to be grateful. Yeah. As the songwriter says, because there's someone else who are worse off than you. And we ought to just be grateful. Because he didn't have to do it, but he did. And during our reading this, this week, I'm grateful for my salvation not dependent on my ethnic background. Hmm. That all who call on the name of the Lord can be Israel. And that we read this week. So I'm just grateful. And in this season of Thanksgiving, let's have a grateful heart as we go about our days. As the choir comes. This is a Walter Hawkins classic. Oh. 
because there's someone worse off than you are. Be grateful. Be grateful. And love to be in your shoes. Be grateful. Oh, be grateful. Be grateful. Be grateful. Be grateful. as we reflect on this past week so many things that we could be grateful for could you take me down in the monitors just consider for a moment just last week, I'm not even asking you to look back over your entire life. Just consider last week and the goodness of God towards you. Of all people, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ and the pardon of their sins, we always have something to be thankful for, amen? Amen. Thank you, praise and worship team, for leading us this morning. And I quickly wanted to mention, uh, I'm grateful for Dr. Samuel and his entire family, Sister Peace, and for the Temple Gospel Miracle. Uh, it's just about, it's almost like a year anniversary, isn't it? When y'all began to come in and worship. Uh, we are grateful for you and your ministry and all that you're doing for the Lord through his local church. Let us thank the Lord for Dr. Samuel's entire family. Well, welcome to each and every one of you to this church that is gathered at Forest Baptist, where we have just completed week 45. Week 45 in our Bible reading plan, amen? 
And I, as I say every week, it's not too late. Even if you have it done week one through 44, you still got time to join us in our Bible reading plan as we are, uh, this year, have been going through the entire Bible together. Uh, if you are looking for that Bible reading plan, you, they're, they're, uh, it's listed online. It is inside the Church Center uh, app. It is also some printed out copies in the foyer on your way out. Amen? Why don't you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, how wonderful and how awesome is your name. Father, we are not worthy to stand before you. We're not even worthy to call upon your holy and righteous name. But yet, because you have loved us so deeply and so richly, we can stand before your mighty throne because of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for filling us with your Holy Spirit that we would forever be grateful for all that you have done. Not only have you given us life, you have given us life forevermore. Father, upon today, as we have entered to worship, there are many struggles, many issues of life. Many problems, many losses. But Lord, we stand on your promises and you promise that your grace would be sufficient. So Father, I ask that you would pour out sufficient grace upon us today that we would hear from heaven, that we would love Jesus more, that we would give our lives unto service to you both now and forevermore that this church would be a beacon of light a ray of hope and help to all who comes into uh, this 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 our sphere of influence we thank you that where we're located this past 155 years I, I thank you for this city I thank you for these families and Father, I ask that you would now magnify yourself and glorify yourself through us, Lord. May we be those tools that you use to make much of Jesus on today. Father, for the one who is lost in their sin, for the one that Satan has blinded their eyes, I ask that you would remove the scales from their eyes, that you would unstop ears, that you would soften hard hearts. Lord, you have, you have already declared there is a, there, there's a people in this city for you. There's a people that you're calling out. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would call many upon today. And Father, not only call many, but I ask that you would encourage many. Please encourage us through and by your word, O oh Lord. We need you. And Father, we would be ever so careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray. And all of God's people said together, amen, amen. Amen. Well, turn with me, if you would, in your copy of God's Word to Romans, the 13th chapter. Romans, the 13th chapter, and I, I, I tell you, this week's Bible reading plan was fantastic. I mean, uh, every week is fantastic, uh, but when you encounter uh, this so great a salvation, this is what Paul is writing to uh, the Roman Christians, he's writing about uh, such a great salvation, and he talks about in, in Romans 7 how we've been freed from the law. In uh, and, and, and Romans 8, he says in 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. Uh, he goes on and, uh, and further down in, in, in chapter 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, so tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors in him, through him who loved us. He goes on in, verse, in chapter 10, because that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confess, confesses and is saved. He goes on to say, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they, are they to believe in him in, 
of whom they have never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. He goes on in chapter 11 and talks about they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. And in verse 33 of the 11th chapter, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things to him. Be the glory forever. Amen. Then he goes into chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Over and over again, he points to this esteemed glory of Christ. Yet on the heels of last week's sermon in Romans 6, the Apostle Paul in Romans the 13th chapter, he continues to urge the Roman Christians to do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. And my prayer is that those were not merely words that you read on a piece of paper or, or heard preached on last week, but my prayer is that by grace you were able to present your members to God as instruments of righteousness, even on last week. But this morning's text is a continuation of that uh, admonition from the Apostle Paul. And as I just read, as many of you know, there's a, a shift in the letter that Paul writes to this church at the 12th chapter mark. He has been building this argument about salvation, our, our need for salvation because of our sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he goes on to talk about the great gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And he goes on to talk about whether you're Jews or Gentiles, we are all in desperate need of Christ Jesus. And he talks about how Jesus, uh, the promise of him coming, it has been made a long time ago and has come forth and come to fruition through Jesus Christ. He's, he's building this argument about what salvation is and who we are because of this salvation. But in verse 12, he makes a shift and says, because of who you are, now this is how you should live. This is how you should live now. Don't live like you used to live because you're different now. A change has come. A change has taken place. Don't live how you used to. And, and from chapters 12 throughout the rest of his letter, he is calling them to do what? Be Christian. We talked about that a little this morning in, in reference to the text uh, what, 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 what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing is that uh, now that you know who you are, now that you have experienced this great salvation, be Christian. In chapters 12, he talks about uh, uh, being humble because of this great salvation, being active. He says in, in verse 6 of the 12th chapter, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to you, let us use them. Don't be sitting on all those gifts that God has given you. Now, he says be active. He, he, he talks about being obedient and being humble to those in authority. He, he talks about being Christian. And here, towards the end of the 13th chapter, Paul talks about, he speaks of the urgency of being Christian. You know, there's an urgency to being Christian. There, there, there's an urgency to, to do what we've been called to do. So here in Romans, the 13th chapter, we'll just take a quick look at verses 11 through 14. Romans, the 13th chapter, verses 11 through 14. If you are able, please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. This is the word of God. Please hear the voice of Christ. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you 
to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. May the, war, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. This morning, I w- this morning, I would like to just entitle this text, Don't Wait to Get Right with God. Don't Wait to Get Right with God. You know, in the past, we've talked about the dangers of distracted driving. When I say distracted, the The first thing that most of us think about in these days is texting and driving and how we are holding up our phones while we attempt to navigate down the roadway. I mean, it it got so bad now, I'm passing people, they watching full YouTube videos and everything, like they video chatting. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Because don't nobody in forest do that. distracted, but not only is it the use of electronics, it's things like eating in your car, talking to passengers in the car. You ever roll with somebody, you like, stop talking to me and look at the road. Like, look forward, stop looking at me. Grooming, doing your hair, eyebrows, and all kind of stuff. Well, you know, the CDC actually reports that Nine people in the United States are killed every day in crashes that are reported to involve a distracted driver. That's over 3,000 people per year. The National Highway and and, uh, Transportation Safety Administration reported that distracted driving caused about 324,000 injuries in 2020 alone. Those within the ages of 15 to 20 represent 7%, the greatest total of those fatalities. You hear that? Over 3,000 preventable deaths if only drivers were paying attention. Preventable deaths. Hear that, somebody. These deaths weren't impending. These Deaths didn't have to be. They, they weren't a result of a uh, conviction of murder. or They, they, they weren't trying to uh, 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 enter into a foreign country and, and trying to uh, labor with the gospel, even though uh, they may lose their life. The 3,000 preventable deaths, if only drivers had paid attention. These statistics made me wonder something else. I wonder how many lives have been lost because of distracted Christianity. A Christianity not focused on pursuing Jesus and his righteousness. A Christianity that doesn't really take sin seriously. This is a Christianity that doesn't change lives, that though there has been a profession, ain't nothing really changed on the inside. This, the type of distracted Christianity where grace has been taken for granted just because Jesus has always been there, you think he'll be there tomorrow waiting for you. Beloved, Paul knows the consequence of taking sin lightly, he talks about it in the book of Romans. As a matter of fact, in Romans 6, 23, what does he say? For the wages of sin, the payment of sin is what? Death. Eternal separation. Because 
sin in our lives separates us from a holy and righteous God, if we, are, if we continue driving in life without dealing with sin, we will receive the payment of death. And, and in these days, it's easy to, to, to kind of theorize what sin is. Kind of, uh, just sin is just this thing. But, but when we think about sin, sin, uh, the word really means to miss the mark. If, if you were in archery and you are trying to hit the bullseye and you, and you pull back the bow and you release and you hit anything besides the bullseye, that you have missed the mark. And, and, and what this word is trying to communicate is that God has a standard, a, a, a mark by, by which we should live. And, and if we don't hit that mark that we are in sin, when, when, when I don't speak as lovingly as I should, I've missed the mark. When, when I have a heart full of bitterness and unforgiveness, I, I, I'm missing the mark. When, when, when I think I can just say whatever I want to say to people and say it's a joke, I, I'm missing the mark. Uh, when, when I'm living in situations of sexual promiscuity, I am missing the mark. When I, when I let anything become a master over my life and, and cause me to do what I would normally not do, I, I am missing the mark. This is sin, and this is what causes a separation between us and God and damns those to hell who never repent of it. These are the consequences of sin, and what Paul is doing in this text, he is calling these Christians to live each day intentionally for Jesus. If I was to summarize what Paul is saying is simply put off sin and put on Jesus before your time runs out to get right with God. Put off sin and put on Jesus before time runs out to get right with God. And it's in interesting because as I was reading this text, who is Paul talking to? He's talking to church folks. He's talking about good old church folks who show up to the synagogue every week, that, who, who gather together, they, they bring their money, they, they wear the right things, they say the right things, they look the part, right? Hey, he's talking to church folks. He's not out in the streets preaching to the Gentile pagans that's walking up down the, uh, the prostitute lane. He's not hanging out by the liquor store. He's not at the strip club. He, he, he's not at the places. He's up in the church. So if Paul talking to the church about putting off sin, then, then maybe he's on to something about what we need to do today. And what Paul is saying, you got to get right with God. Because time is running out. Here in verse 11 and 11 and 12, Paul shows us you, you get right with God by paying attention to the times. Pay attention. He says, Besides this, you know the time. You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep. Wake up. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Some of y'all can testify to that. Because it's been a while since you first believed. Praise God for your faithfulness, but it's been a while. And what he's saying is, you, you ain't as young as you used to be. But then also, the time of Jesus' is coming back is closer than what it used to be. And then he, go, he goes on to explain, he says, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. He's, he's using that uh, metaphorically. When he says the night is far gone, he's talking about this present age. That we're, we're, we've been walking through this present age for a while. It's, it's almost over. It's almost come to an end. And he says, and, and, and on top of that, the day is at hand. The, 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 the sun is about to break in the morning. The sunrise is about to come. The day that Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom. He says, wake up. You don't have a lot of time left. You, you know, I've been on a campaign lately to reclaim, if you would say, uh, the word woke. See, because you want to know it by how it's been appropriated and turned into a pejorative, but the phrase to be woke or stay woke has 
actually been a part of the black community and black vernacular going back to the 1930s. See, within the black community, woke has always meant to, to be alert to racial prejudice and discrimination, racially motivated threats and potential dangers of living in America. Uh, a perfect example of that is, is, is that movie out right now about Emmett Till. Till. He, he's from the north, right? And, and, but he goes down south, and, and, and he's not alert aware to how racism would take his life over one unwritten rule, one mistake. To be socially conscious. Beloved, I dare say, in a sense, Paul is telling these Roman Christians to be woke. To be alert, to be aware, to be conscious of the sin that so easily entangles. And just in case you want to run out of here and say, my pastor done went woke, I brought some receipts. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, Paul says in verse 34, wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, I say this to your shame. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Paul goes on to say in the 11th verse, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything's exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. Why? Because the days are evil. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse four, Paul once again says, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You, you know it's coming. Don't be surprised. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not in the night of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, y'all need to wake up to what's really going on. Sin so easily entangles you. Don't play with sin. He, he's saying it's time to be attentive because the time is drawing near to the time Jesus returns and time for eternity begins. But yet we live in a world where we think human history would just go on forever. You know, I, I got to thinking about a, a, a lot of like the issues going on and I, I don't know where you are on, on, on climate change or if you believe it's true or if you, you don't believe it's true, but, but, but something's happening. Something's going on, right? And, and but, but, I mean, but think about it. If this earth was really meant to be our home, it wouldn't be fading away like it is. Maybe, just maybe, when the earth fell because of sin and creation began to groan, may, maybe because God had a plan for a new heaven and new earth, this place was never meant to be permanent in the first place. Now, I'm not saying that we mistreat and, and abuse what we have. We are to be faithful stewards, having right dominion over what God has given us. But maybe, just maybe, well, this place ain't really supposed to be here forever. And if that's the case, then maybe we should pay attention to what's really going on around us. That this world is passing away and Paul, he is imploring these Christians to have a spiritual sensitivity to the times in which we live. 
the Old Testament, as the mighty men are coming to be with David, it talks about the men of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Do you know what you ought to do with your life right now for Jesus? Christians should understand this world is passing away. But not only is this world passing away, Christians, we need to understand that we are passing away. But here's what Paul is getting to. As Christians, you should understand, as the Puritan John Owens would say, that you must be killing sin or sin will be killing you. If you're not dealing with the sin that's in your life, even though you're saved, even though you're saved, I I would submit to you that you have settled for a less than life. Though you may ink into heaven, though you may, may show up before the throne smelling like smoke, you are living a less than life if you're not being obedient to Jesus now. Because he says, I have come that they may have life and that more abundantly. Now, he's not talking about material possessions. He's talking about the quality of being in an intimate relationship with him and with the Father. But forevermore, that you are filled with shalom. You are filled with peace. You have a sense of human flourishing because you are seeking to follow Jesus. That's the life that he's talking about. The life where where you're looking over what's going on. and, 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 And though there may be issues it's not chaos because you bring up these problems but you can actually have peace even in the middle of the situations of this world sin has a way of lulling us into a false sense of security and and we just accept it we just accept it like yeah i mean it's, it's just part of life I, I remember uh taking my youth group to uh, a conference one time, and and and, and the lady who was who was speaking uh, to us, she, she made such a great point. She said, "Even as sin, even as Christians, sin has so permeated our hearts and minds that uh, we will unintentionally think just like the world." And, and she gave us an example, and she said, "So finish up my sentence. When you when you're dating, make sure you practice safe." And everybody said, "Sex." All right. Even within Christian circles, we would say stuff like, yeah, you just be careful out there. Make sure you wrap it up and, you know, you make sure you, you, you got your birth control. And yeah. as Christians, when Jesus himself, through his word, talks about sexual immor- the sexually immoral would not enter the kingdom of God. Sin so easily entangles us, we will take expressions from the world and bring it right into church and act like nothing's wrong. Paul is talking to Christians because he knows, though we are not uh, of this world, we're still in this world. We still have to fight. We still have to claw. We still have to pursue Jesus with all of our strength and might. Day to myself, but I was thinking back to the Wiz. I love the Wiz. I love the Wiz. I was thinking about that scene. You remember that scene where the lion was was going up on that roof, and the the poison poppies came out. And and, and the poison. I got to explain this to the young folk. You need, first, you need to watch the Wiz. And, and the poison poppies were these seductresses uh, that metaphorically represented the sexual pleasures of the day and uh, drug use. And as they, and as the, the lion got separated from the group, as they were on their way easing down the road, they began to seduce him, to distract him to dance around him, to, to blow this smoke on him. And, 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 and soon, soon, soon sure, sure as it is day, he, 
he finds himself slumped down. Halfway sleep. Because he's been distracted by these poison poppies. Beloved, I don't know what poison poppy you got in your life, but there are some things that we hold close that are causing us to fall asleep when it comes to dealing with our sin. There's an urgency for the nowness of your salvation. Jesus doesn't want you to say, I will wait until I get right. I will wait until I get older. He's, what Paul is trying to help you understand, you might not get older. You might not get tomorrow. These days are passing. There's an urgency. Don't wait, to de- don't wait until you think you're strong enough to deal with your sin. That's what Jesus died for. That's why we have the power of the Holy Spirit living with You will never be strong enough to deal with your own sin. You're not supposed to be strong enough because we're weak. But he says, my power is perfected in your weakness. When, when I am weak, he is strong. There's that urgency of now for your salvation. Don't wait to try to be saved. Walk with Jesus now. Today, this moment, Paul, he, he urges them, like, you get right with God by paying attention. But then secondly, he says, you get right with God by putting off sin and putting on Jesus. Verse 12, the second half of it, he says, but because I need to wake up, he says, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. He's talking about these sins that so easily entangles us. And of all people, Paul knows the struggle in the flesh with sin. In our reading this week, if you went back to Romans, the seventh chapter, Paul, he he, he opens up his life and shows that he may look like he got it all together on the outside, but there's a war, there's a wrestling going on on the inside. And and what he's saying is, uh, but because my mind has been renewed, because I have this great salvation, I want to live for Jesus. I want to obey. I want to pursue him. But I'm still contained in this this fleshly body that has remnants of sin, and this flesh always wants what it wants. It wants to get its way, and its way is always contrary to the spirit. Though Though my soul wants to follow the spirit, my flesh wants to follow this world. And he said, there's a war raging. And he, he said, the things I, I want to do, I don't do. And the things I, 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 I don't do, I, I want to do. He, he's talking about that, that wrestling. But he goes back and said, but glory be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he sees the exit sign on his life, a, 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 a life of sin. He says, I can't do it, but Jesus can. I can't do it, but Jesus can. And though we have been saved from the penalty of sin, we still wrestle with the fleshly remnants of our sin for lives. Beloved, sin is like quicksand. It looks like you can walk over it. it. It looks like you can get to the other side of the pathway. But as soon as you step in it, it takes you under. And then once it takes you over under, the more you struggle in it, it will take you down even further. That reminds me of that quote we often say, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And and we we thought we was just taking a trip down memory lane. (laughs) We, we thought we was just DMing somebody who, who I went to high school with. And then we look up, I done fell into an adulterous relationship just because I thought it would be fun. Sinking. 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 Sinking deeper in sin. Far from the peaceful shore. Sinking. Sinking. And ultimately, this sin, when it takes you under, it will destroy your life and it will destroy your witness. 
Oh, if you don't believe that it won't destroy your witness, just, just think about any of these pastors. Any, just think about the destruction and chaos that comes when a shepherd falls. Just think about what happens to its church when, when its shepherd falls into sin, into some type of moral failure, and all the chaos and destruction that's left behind. You may not be a pastor, but you got people watching you. You may not be a pastor, but you got influence over somebody. And when you fall and sinking in sin, they're looking at you as like, well, I thought they loved Jesus. I, I thought they had some power in the, in the, the ability to say no. I thought there was someone else. And, and though you may not be a pastor, your, sin, uh, your sinful habits are causing destruction in your path. Your life's like a mini hurricane, tearing up trees, tearing up houses, and you wonder why people won't trust your Jesus. This is, this, but this is why Paul says there's hope. But there's hope. It doesn't have to be like that. He says, this is why you need to cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. He said, cast off those orgies, those, those drunken, uh, drunken parties. Remember, I, I spoke to it before when they're talking about orgies and drunkenness in the Bible. It's, it's, it's primarily not like a, a sexual orgy, but it's just these, dr these drunken turn up parties. He said, that's a work of darkness. Sexual immorality sexual practices outside the will of God, sensuality, this, this, this notion that sex sells. But it's interesting because he talks about those, the, the lust of the flesh, but then he goes on and he says, cast off quarreling and jealousy. Huh. Uh-oh, somebody. How they say, amen lights. He's talking about bad attitudes. He's talking about always arguing, always fussing. He's talking about the jealousy that's in your heart. So like, oh, why they got it? Why I don't have it? Uh, or, or in a sense, uh, uh, I've been walking with Jesus all this time. Why they, why they getting all the blessings? He says those are works of darkness. That's sin. And that sin will, will wreak havoc in your life. And ultimately, you, you got that root of bitterness because you were never able to forgive. You got that, that root of bitterness that, that keeps you from loving people, period, because of that one bad relationship. You got that root of bitterness that's keeping you from loving God because, because you're so ashamed of that sin. He's saying, he's saying, cast it off, take it off. You don't have to keep it on. Take it off. But we don't just take it off and put on anything. He says, put on the armor of light. He says, and walk properly as in the daytime. This, the metaphors of darkness and light. And I like how he puts it, this armor of light. So, in the first sense, Paul wants these Roman Christians to understand that God has an objective standard for morality. God has his standard for holiness. We don't get to make it up ourselves. When, when, he is specifically talking about specific things, not this, oh, I sinned. No, well, what did you do? Did you lie? Did you steal? Did you, like, what, don't, don't just say, Lord, don't, don't go to bed at night. And do that covering prayer like we, well, like we like to do. We, we try to cover it all. Lord, forgive you my sins today. Well, what sin? What sin are you talking about? What exactly did you do wrong? Do you need to go back and make it right? Do you need to provide restitution of some sort? Or are you just trying to say, Lord, forgive me my sins so you can get, a, get out of a uh, jail free card? And he says, put on that armor of light 
Put on what God deems it in Philippians 4. No, yeah, when he talks about what is good, what is acceptable, what is love. Like, those are the things he wants us to put on in our lives instead. And he says that, but, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. When I read that, I immediately thought of Philippians 2, where the text says, uh, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that though he was in the form of God, he didn't count it uh, uh, equality with God, something to be grasped, but he took upon human flesh. It, so so, what, what, so what, what he's saying is, G, uh, Jesus being God, he gave up his glory, put on humanity, and came for us. I thought about that because Jesus clothed himself in humanity. What Paul is causing, calling us to do is to do the exact opposite. Instead of clothing yourself in humanity, we, uh, uh, Christians, we, we, we don't want to uh, hold on to this human form and, and counting it as something that is worthy. But we take upon ourselves the, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through repentance and faith. And now we are clothed with his righteousness. And as Romans 6 says, in order that we may, uh, we may die to sin and we are raised to walk in the newness of life. That's, that's what it looks like to put on Jesus. We, we put on his robe of righteousness because we've chosen to strip ourselves naked and bare before the mighty throne of God. Lord, I, I'm okay. I'm okay with being transparent with you. Lord, I... I'm okay because I, because I believe your promise when you say there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I can stand before you completely naked. Uh, uh, there's nothing hindering our relationship. And I can be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, his robe. When I was young, there'd be times, of course, I w wanted to be like my father and he used to wear this this robe around the house and, and and when he was away sometimes i would i would i would put on his robe and and tie it up and act like i was my daddy it it, it you know it kind of felt like him it smelled like him and, and, and i would put on that robe and act like my like my daddy what, uh, what, 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 what what jesus wants us to do is to clothe ourselves with his robe of righteousness right and <laughs> And, and as we put on his robe of righteousness, we, we, we start to look like Jesus, right? We, we put on his robe, we, we, we start to smell like Jesus, and we start to walk and talk like Jesus. And uh, I, I ain't know nothing about wearing no robe. I, I used to wear my Aquaman underwear. I mean, I, I used to put on a robe and, and put my hand in the pocket and walk like that down the hallway. I ain't know nothing about that. But this is what Jesus is saying. You ain't got to know everything about what it means to be righteous. You just need to put on my robe. And, and you just need to walk like you see me walk. You just need to talk like you see me talk. And, and you'll start looking like me and understanding what it means to be clothed in his righteousness. And the amazing thing is, is as we put on his righteousness, Jesus is actually our armor of light. He's the armor of light. We are to put on Jesus because he is the one who is truth. And when we put Jesus on, I can start walking in truth. And when I put on Jesus, I put on his righteousness, so now I can start walking in righteousness. And when I put on uh, Jesus I, 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 and, and, and I take upon his peace, I'm able to start walking in peace. And, and when I put on the, the armor of light, his uh, his faith, I, I'm able to walk in faith. And when I, I put on his salvation, I'm able to walk in salvation. And when I'm indwelled with the spirit, I'm indwelled with the very same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave. And what I love about the armor of light, he says, and make no provisions for the flesh. When we put on that armor of light, we are placing a barrier between ourselves and sin. Make no provisions for the flesh means you have to put up some barriers to sin. You got to put some barriers. You can't do this. You, you can't, you can't, you can't have the same friends. 
if they're pulling you in the sand. You, you, you can't keep him around if he only go to church to make you happy. Ah. You, you can't go to the same place, the same, the same clubs and the same bars and, and, and expect a different outcome. He says, you got, if you're wearing this armor of light, you got to put some, so a barrier between you and sin. And why does he say that? Because at the end of the day, beloved, I don't care how strong you is, you can't handle sin. You can't handle it. You, you think you step in your, you think you step, you step in your toe in, into sin, and uh, all of a sudden you look up, your, you know, your whole body done fit. You can't handle sin. Oh, I got this. I can say no anytime. I can let him go. I can let her go. Then do it. If you so bad, why don't you go ahead and do it? Oh, you good for a week. Let her stop, let her stop texting you for a week. Nah, that's just an email. Nah. <laughs> Paul knows you can't handle, I can't handle, I don't care how strong you is. You can't handle it. So you got to have that barrier, that, that armor of light that you place between you and sin in order that you would live a life to its fullness that abundant life. Beloved, putting, putting, on, putting off sin and putting on Jesus is a daily pursuit that requires your time and attention. You can't put off, Jesus, you can't put off sin and put on Jesus if you never spend time with him. I'm not a proponent of a salvation that you got to do to get that you got to do these things in order to be saved. But I'm, I'm certainly a proponent that because I am saved, I want to do these things. I don't care how strong you think you are. I don't, I don't care how strong you think you are. If you walk away from the people of God and try to live this Christianity by yourself, then you are underestimating sin and overestimating your strength. We need Jesus. I have to spend time with him. I have to pray. I have to read my word. I have to come around the people of God. I have to give of myself and serve. I, I, I have to. Beloved, one of the things that we need to ask ourselves today we have to commit to today is asking God to make you aware to the sin that's in your life today. How do I know that you have sin in your life? First John 1 and 8 reminds us that if you say you have no sin in you, you lie. And the truth is not in you. That, that's the Bible way of saying you would you a, you a dirty dog lie. You lie and the truth is not in you. That's double. <laughs> so what we need to be asking is we, we, we don't have to cower. We, we don't have to cower in shame and guilt. That's Satan. Because Jesus says who the son has set free is free indeed. So I, I come before the throne with all my sin. And I say, I say, Lord, look at all this mess. I, I, I need you to take this away from me. I done tried to clean up, and I can't, I, I can't clean this up. I, I need you to clean me up. I need you to take this from me. I need you to, to take this taste out of my mouth. I, I need you to regulate my mind. I, I need you to order my steps because I can't do it. But, but here's the thing, Christian. Once you ask him, you got to listen, and you got to do what he say. We'll ask him. We'll ask him. But what does he say? Oh, oh, wait, now, wait, well, hold up, Lord. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. Nah. I, I, let, me, like, let me just hold on now for just a little longer, Lord. He's like, no, kill it now because it's killing you. 
Beloved, don't wait to get right with God. Jesus has already secured the right for you to be made right with God. He's already secured it. John, he says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus has already done what was needed to secure your right to be made right with God. So it's not the work that you have to do. It's the work that he's already done. Is that not the good news of the gospel? That though we have no right to stand before a good and holy God, Jesus makes it right. Jesus made it right when he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but came down born of a virgin. Jesus made a right when he was found in the temple and said, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? Do you know that Jesus made a right when he caused the lame to walk and told the woman caught in the adulterous situation to go and sin no more? Jesus was making it right when he walked on the water and he controlling the winds and the waves and said, peace be still, he was making it right. He was making it right when he got to the other side and the demoniac that was out of his mind could not pursue Jesus. And he touched him. And just with that touch, the, the demons had to flee. Jesus was making it right. He was making it right. When he gave up his life and told the disciples, this is my body that was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He was making a right. Jesus was making a right when he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Oh, Jesus was making a right when he told Judas, go ahead, get up. You got something to do. And Jesus was making a right when he was on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he was going, previously he had told Peter, he said, Peter, Satan wants to sift you. He says, but I've been praying for you, not to take you out of the world, but that you will have strength in this world to go through. Jesus was making it right. And as he was on his knees praying to the Father, oh, Lord, if this cup could be passed, let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus was making it right. Jesus was making it right when he allowed them to take him from courtroom to courtroom on trumped up charges. When Jesus, when they, when they said, won't nobody come to your aid? Jesus said, I can call the legion of angels right now. And, but, but by standing down, Jesus was making it right. Jesus was making it right when he took that crown of thorns and put it on his head. And, and Jesus was making a right when they let him, he let them strip him naked. And they beat him all night long. But, 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 but Jesus was making a right when he walked up the road to Golgotha to Calvary. And he was making it right when they, he stretched out his right hand. Oh, they wasn't stressing out for him. He was stressing it out for you. And, and Jesus was making a right when they stretched out his left hand. And Jesus was making a right when they put nails through his feet. And Jesus was making it right when they, when they stood him up. But I remember that the text says, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus was making it right. And Jesus was making it right as he was hung between two thieves as a common criminal. And he wasn't caring about his reputation. But he, but he stood there and he took the wrath of God. You, your sin and my sin was placed upon him at Calvary. And he bore the wrath of God. He bore it all day long to the point where the sun would not shine anymore. Jesus was making it right. And Jesus made it right when he hung his head and said, it is 
finished and gave up the ghost. That's what the KJV says. But Jesus wasn't finished making it right. He made it right after they buried him in a burial tomb. And they put ointments all over his body because death thought he had him. Satan thought he won. But Jesus was just making it right. As he descended into hell, was declared to all y'all, I'm about to get up. And when I get up, I'm going to set the captives free. And on the third day, Jesus made it right because he got up with all power in his hand. And when he rose with all power in his hand, he made it right for you and he made it right for me. But it doesn't stop there because Jesus went on to minister to his disciples for, for some more time, teaching them what it means to, to follow him and restore Peter. And then he said, I want y'all to come up and meet me on this mountain. And he gave them some final words that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And Jesus made a right when he stepped up on the escalator to glory with the cloud. And Jesus is making a right right now because he says he sits on the right hand of the Father and is seating on my behalf. I don't know about you, but I need some prayer. I'm so glad my mama prayed. I'm so glad my daddy prayed. I'm so glad my grandma prayed. But I tell you what, I'm so glad that Jesus is praying for me right now. Jesus made a right by living a life we could not live and dying the death that we deserve. And Jesus is going to make it right once and for all in the day when the trumpets sound and the clouds break forth open. And the text says we will meet him in the air for him to rule and to reign forevermore. And it's through repentance and faith that Jesus takes what he made right and applies it to your soul to make you right. For Jesus to make you right, you just simply might say something like this, Lord, forgive me for being a sinner, for sinning against you. I believe that Jesus did come and he did die for my sins. Would you please come into my life and save me and help me to live for him both now and forevermore because I know through your blood I was made right. Beloved, put off sin and put on Jesus before your time runs out to get right with God. Don't wait to get right with God. Father, thank you for your word. The power of your word and the fact that you have saved a wretch like me. So great a salvation that allows me to die to sin, but to live to your righteousness. So Father, help us all to forsake these pet secret sins, that you would be glorified and magnified even the more. We pray this in the matchless and mighty and magnificent name of Jesus the Messiah. This we pray. Amen. What's your next step? That's the question we ask after every sermon. Now that you heard from God, What's your next step? Is Jesus calling you to turn from your life, living for yourself, and to turn to him by faith? If today is the day of salvation, then don't let it pass. Don't wait. Jesus has come to set you free. You ain't got to wait to be set free. He's come to set you free today. Surrender to Jesus today. Or maybe the Lord is, is burning your heart. You are a follower of him, but the struggle is hard and you just need someone to pray with you, pray over you. 
you can come up. Or maybe there's various issues of life. Things just going on. And I just want somebody to pray for me. You come. <clears throat> or maybe the Lord is calling you to, to rededicate your life to him. You've been away. But now it's time to come back home. Or maybe the Lord is calling you to be a part of this covenant fellowship. Become a member of Forest Baptist Church. Whatever your need is, each one of these aisles lead to the front. You can talk to one of our men, one of our women. Whether you need a salvation, prayer, rededication, or membership, you can come as we all stand and sing our closing song. Let us all stand. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. Oh, that's love. That's love. Yeah. Said Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me that's love that's love Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me that's love oh that's love yeah jesus went to calvary to save a wretch like you and me that's love that's love Like you and me, that's love. Oh, that's love, that's love. Yeah. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch. Like you and me, that's love. Love. That's not how the story's in. Three days later, he rose again. That's love. That's love. Yeah. That's not how. The story in three days later, he rose again. That's love. That's love. That's not how the story in three days later. He rose again, that's love, oh, that's love. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me, that's love. That's love, but that's not how the story ends. Three days later, he rose again. That's love, that's love, that's love. 
last love, last love, last love, oh, last love, last love, last love. Last love. That's love. <clears throat> That's love. That's love. That's love. That's love. <clears throat> because of that love, <clears throat> we have the opportunity to gather as followers of Jesus to commemorate that night he laid down his life. As we prepare to come to the table to partake of our Lord's Supper for communion, <clears throat> on your way in, we were passing out elements, but if you don't have the elements, just Raise your hand and someone will come to you. <clears throat> what we have in the Lord's Supper is this perpetual reminder of the new and greater exodus through the new and greater covenant we've received through Jesus Christ. And all who embrace his life, his death, and resurrection find release from sin's bondage and deliverance into everlasting life. This is what we're commemorating when we come to the table. This is what we're remembering that Jesus laid down his life that we could live. So as we prepare <clears throat> to take of the Lord's Supper, the passing out, the elements right now, But in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul lays out how we are to come to this table. And he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, <clears throat> that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we come to partake of the Lord's Supper, this is the opportunity the means of grace where we have a gathered opportunity just to reflect in our hearts those issues of sin. And we have the opportunity right now to give that to Jesus right now. In the quietness of your heart, just take a moment to sit before the Lord and 
seek forgiveness for specific sins, asking him that he would give you strength and grace to pursue him even more. And just as he lives today, that he will give you life. After we pause for a minute, <clears throat> I'll pray and then we'll stand and take the elements together. Father, thank you for your great love, for being so marvelous and majestic, yet you took upon yourself lowly humanity, that you would come and be the lamb of the world who takes away sin. So, Father, as we come to the table right now, I ask that you would forgive me, you would forgive us of our sin collectively. Show us how we have failed. Show us how we have not met the mark. That we would repent and turn towards you. Not from fear of condemnation, because there is no condemnation for those in Christ, but that we may live this life to its fullest and not settling for a life cluttered with sin. So, Father, we come right now thanking you for your broken body and your shed blood. And as we gather as a collective people who love you, we love you. We thank you for the privilege and the honor. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us all stand to partake. <clears throat> On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. He broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And that same night, Jesus took the cup. He said, this, this cup is the covenant. It's a new covenant in my blood. Do also as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. You may be seated. Do we have announcements today? <clears throat> Good afternoon, Forest Baptist Church. Please draw your attention to the screen for our afternoon announcements. We would like to take this time to welcome anyone who is visiting with us today. Welcome to Forest Baptist Church. There are multiple opportunities to get connected. These opportunities include Soap Bible Study, Sunday Morning Groups, also known as Sunday School, and Sunday Morning Worship. We hope to see you again in the near future. Are you celebrating a birthday or anniversary in the month of November? If so, please stand and wave your hand so that we can recognize you. Happy birthday and happy anniversary on behalf of your Forest Baptist Church family. On Friday, November the 11th, our nation will pause to recognize all of our men and women that have served faithfully for the freedom of our country. If you are an active or former service man or woman, can you please stand so that we can recognize you? Happy Veterans Day on behalf of your friends and family here at Forest Baptist Church. We thank you for your commitment and service to our country. Today is your last day to pick up an application for the Angel Tree Program here at Forest Baptist Church. Please see Sister Wanda Green in the foyer if you have any additional questions. Rehearsals for our 2022 Children's Day have officially begun. 
These rehearsals will take place immediately after church service each Sunday. Please see Sister Pauletta if you have any additional questions regarding participation. Proper health insurance is a key component to maintaining a higher quality of life no matter your age. The Community Assisted Research and Education Group, also known as the CARE Initiative, is partnering with McFalls Academy to offer personalized guidance in navigating the healthcare insurance arena. Clinics will be hosted in November and December from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. If you have any questions, please contact the number or email on the screen for additional details. The Forest Baptist Church Marriage Ministry would like to invite you to our last session of the year, which will be held on Friday, November the 18th. The title of this session will be Practical Communication, and it will be led by Rev. Sanchez and Vicki Jackson of Watson Memorial Baptist Church. Please RSVP via the Church Center app or by email at oneflush at fbcnewberg.org. If you have any questions, please feel free to see Brother Jarvon Lindsay or Sister Tanika Lindsay. Please go ahead and save the date for our Pizza and Pajamas holiday party here at the church. This will take place on December the 17th and all are invited to join us. More details will come in the coming weeks. Underneath the shepherding of our lead pastor, Nathaniel Bishop Jr., we have been charged to make, mark, and mature disciples for Jesus Christ from Newburgh to the nations. One way in which we will do this is by continuing to read our word. Here at Forest Baptist Church, we are committed to growing in our understanding of God's word. Each week, we have a set of scriptures that we read that are then applied to our soap Bible studies, Sunday morning groups, and our Sunday morning worship. The scriptures for this week are located on the screen. A copy of the reading schedule can also be found online at www.fbcnewberg.org, in our Church Center app, and paper copies are available in the foyer. This concludes our announcements for today. If you missed any of these, you can find a copy on our Facebook page. We pray God's peace and blessings over you until we meet again. Bye-bye. Have more light in the community, whether solar light. So they actually have some free solar lights, some porch lights, deck lights, and ground lights that you can put around your house to help light up the Newburgh neighborhood. So if you're a resident of Newburgh and you would like that, uh, grab one of these flyers for this training on Friday. And last but not least, I just thank you, Forrest, for how you're responding to this challenge. Um, <clears throat> on today, I think we are over, three. I think we are like 310,000 in our giving for the year, praise God. Um, we are at 86% of our goal. So I'm not even doing the math, but we, 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 are, we are there, and we can make it to 360000 by the end of the year. Again, the reason is that uh, for increased uh, benevolence requests, helping people in the neighborhood for light bills, we, uh, we make sure uh, we have a uh, benevolence committee for all members who are in need. Um, you just call and let us know, and we help you the best we can. We have some, there's some guidelines, but I know that is there for you. Also, an increase in just some of our utilities, but the increase in ministry opportunities, we wanna make sure we have the right staffing and resources to meet the needs of this community. And uh, for as you're showing out, I really appreciate you. So if all heads and hearts are clear, let us all stand, sing our closing song, and receive our closing benediction. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah.
Shaking elbows and a fist with your neighbor. Repeat after me. But my God shall supply all of your needs, all of my needs, according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And we live, bump your neighbor and say, we move and have our being. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For great is he that is in you, that's in me, then he that's in the world. For God is with us, and no one can be against us. For what I say unto one, I say unto all, watch, look, and pray. And get on the holy hub.